interesting shortly. But before we begin, I thought I would just uh, run everyone through a little bit of admin so that they can maximise their uh, time with us today. The session will be recorded, so if there are some things on here that you miss or you would like to revisit, you'll be able to visit the MDPP website within the week and see a recording of this webinar. If you have a question today, uh, either to the panel in general or to a particular patent attorney, please use the Q&A functions of Zoom. And through this, you can also upvote any questions that have already been put out there by another member. If you'd like to be contacted by myself or Stephen or anyone in the MDPP team or any of our panellists today, you can also make note of this uh, by sending us a direct message in the chat or by uh, seeing our contact details on the screen and getting in contact at a later date. Okay, so Stephen Blakeney is our Innovations Manager here at MDPP. He has a background in biomedical engineering and has been involved in medical device development, both here in Australia and overseas. He's also got quite a repertoire for commercialisation of uh, medical devices and worked with both private and government firms here in Australia. Um, so today's webinar series, which is uh, supported by MTP Connect and Ready and our founding um, foundation partner, uh, Flinders University. Stephen will lead off now. Stephen. Thanks, Olivia. So obviously today's all about intellectual property, but we really just wanted to get started with a very brief introduction on the medical device partnering program, uh, particularly the Ideas Incubator. So it all starts with our vision for Australia to be the fastest in the world at taking an idea and turning it into a medical device on the market. And there's lots of groups that are involved in this process and they, um, they all play really crucial roles. And I guess really wanted to focus on the, 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 uh, the role that we play, which is really the very early stage. So our way of helping to, to achieve this vision is that we bring ideas to life. So we often get inquiries from clinicians um, who see a problem every day and they just really want to find a solution to it. And they've got an idea, but they don't know what, where to start with it. Um, we also provide access to experts. We make sure that if someone has already developed a technical um, uh, piece of uh, a medical device that we're able to test it, it's fit for purpose. We can do some de-risking to make sure it's investor ready. And we make sure that people are aware of all of the different opportunities because there are so many different groups that are out there to help people to develop medical devices. We really want to make sure that people are making the most of all of those opportunities. And one very common thing we hear is that people need more money. And often they do, and sometimes they don't because often if you're at the very early stage, People need money because what they really need to do is access expertise or some sort of help. Um, and you're only often limited sometimes on the amount of money you can get. So you really want to be wise with those uh, pulling on those grants. So the ideas incubator, the idea behind it is that we offer 250 hours of product development or clinical trials. Um, uh, we also offer 30 hours of market research all in return for a cash contribution of $5,000. We have a very simple IP policy, which is we don't take any of your IP. We help to develop in that early stage, but we don't take any IP. Uh, we also help to provide both partnering opportunities and help people to get advice from manufacturers and hospitals and many other groups. Today, it's um, our patent attorneys that are joining us. And uh, we also help to identify future funding opportunities. Sometimes those can come through universities um, and sometimes those are government grants through programs such as MTP Connect. So just very quickly, we, um, it's a very competitive program. So we have over hundred applications every year. We do have criteria on our website, which is mdpp.org.au. If you have any doubts about whether you fit the criteria, it's absolutely free to put in an inquiry, fill in the form, we'll get back to you, we'll talk you through it. Whether you're ready now, whether you need a bit more help or guidance before you're ready for the program, that's absolutely fine. We're more than happy. We'd rather you come and talk to us and we're able to give you that advice than we don't hear from you and we never know what you're up to. Um, the diagram shows just a very brief overview of our 
application process, which the program has been running for 12 years. So this has been fine tuned over that time. And um, so we, as the innovations team, will help to guide people through that process. And that's all from me on the, uh, on the ideas incubator. Thanks, Stephen. Okay, so before I introduce our panelists, panel uh, today, I'm going to just uh, launch a poll just to gauge and see uh, everyone in the audience what, um, what level of uh, understanding of uh, IP you have. It might be able to help the panellists be able to structure their questions accordingly or also gauge where people are at. So we've got this in at the moment, runs for about 30 seconds and I can see we're getting some results in now. Ooh, the stats are all moving for me. So far, the uh, second question, I have an idea about different types of IP protection, but not too clear on the process, uh, seems to have the most votes. Just give it a little bit more time. And I'll also get our panel to join us now. Okay, let's see where this polling ended up. So as everyone can see, um, the second question, I have an idea about the different types of IP protection, but are not too clear on the process, seems to be the winner here. So I think we'll all be able to uh, answer our questions and post them accordingly. So thank you for joining us. Um, as you can see here on the screen, we are joined by three wonderful IP attorneys from various parts of Australia and representing different firms. So we've got Sean Kelly from FB Rice. We've got Mary Munro from Phillips Orsman Fitzpatrick and Chris Wilkinson from Madden's. Sean, I might kick off with you just to give everyone an understanding about FB Rice and your role and uh, then over to you, Stephen. Thanks, Olivia. So I'm a patent attorney at FB Rice's Perth office. FB Rice is one of Australia's largest independent patent attorney firms. I'm in the engineering team, so I've got a background in mechanical engineering, physics and applied mathematics. So I do a lot of work with FB Rice's medical device clients. Before I was at FB Rice, I was an in-house patent attorney at a company called Fisher and Paykel Healthcare in New Zealand. So that's New Zealand's biggest medical device company. As well as there, I worked on protecting their inventions in the obstructive sleep apnea space and in the respiratory and acute care space. So that's the hospital space. Um, I just hand over to Mary now. Um, thanks, John. Hi, everybody. Uh, so I'm um, an Irish, UK and a European qualified patent attorney. Um, and I've been practicing IP for 15 years now, including practice in Australia and New Zealand since early 2013. Um, and while I'm a qualified trademark and design attorney as well, nowadays I mostly focus on patenting life sciences, chemical, electrochemical, therapeutic and uh, medical technology inventions. Uh, most of my time is spent drafting patent applications, providing patentability and freedom to operate opinions, patent prosecution, as well as litigation support. And I do lots of IP education talks and seminars as well. Um, it's probably worth mentioning that because I'm multi-jurisdictionally qualified, my patent drafting is particularly internationally focused and uh, my advice and thinking is directed to optimizing protection internationally, especially for Europe. So I also want to mention that Phillips Orman Fitzpatrick is a full service intellectual property law firm uh, with three offices across Australia in Melbourne, Adelaide and Sydney. And we have every type of technical specialist under the sun and a large and experienced medtech team. Uh, we've got a group of IP commercial lawyers um, and a specialized searching arm called IP organizers who are world class experts in all sorts of IP searching, including intelligence searches, uh, as well as novelty and freedom to operate searches. And so I'll hand you now to Chris. Thanks, Mary. So I, uh, I'm a partner with Madden's Patent and Trademark Attorneys uh, who are based in Adelaide. Um, we've been involved with the MDPP in oh, the last 10 or so years of, since, since I started and, and certainly working alongside a lot, of, a lot of their clients over that time. 
I've got a background in experimental physics and worked in defence and, and um, medical research and then been a patent attorney for about 14 years now. I uh, work a lot in the sort of medical device, um, IT, signal processing, comms, engineering, sort of across that, that spectrum. Uh, I did bioinformatics, so I get a little bit of, bit of um, that side of things as, as well into the bio space. Um, I guess the, yeah, we've certainly been closely tied to the MDPV and, and I'll just go out there and visit their, their Adelaide site. Um, so if people have any questions, they can you know, come out and visit me when I'm there. Um, but yeah, happy to, to answer any questions you've got. Okay. Thanks, and back to much. Steve. Thanks everyone. So I think let's kick straight off with um, some of the uh, questions that we've so on the registration form, people are able to send some questions through. I think just before I get to those, I'll ask some of my own questions. So maybe starting with you, Mary. Um, obviously, there's going to be a level of assumed knowledge today. Um, and I think we saw from the survey that people probably are on the perhaps less knowledge of IP. So maybe it'd be good just to start if you could just give us a bit of a refresher on the steps for reaching national phase. And roughly the time frames as well. Okay, sure, no worries, Stephen, thanks. Um, so national phase, so really, I think here you're talking about uh, stages and uh, timelines of the PCT process. Yes. So uh, I might just give a bit of background on what the PCT is for, and then talk about the stages and the timing as we go through that. So really a bit of background is um, patents are national rights. So that means that you have to apply and get patents granted in each country or region that you're actually interested in. Um, and that is complicated and costly because it involves engaging foreign patent attorneys um, and meeting the local formality and paperwork requirements in each of those countries you're interested in. And that often will include um, translation costs um, and official fees payable to the patents offices as well. So yeah, at the outset, there can be a high cost and there's a high risk barrier there, I think, because it's very on, very early on in development and maybe you're not so sure of the commercial direction at that stage. So to avoid these barriers, uh, we use international IP treaties, including the Patent Cooperation Treaty or the PCT as we call it, um, and basically, it allows us uh, to defer costs and decision making until much later uh, when your commercial position is often better understood. Um, the PCT does this by setting up a centralized patent application filing system. Um, and during the initial PCT filing stage, you can follow up your provisional filing. So that's the first application for your invention. Uh, with a single PCT application at the local patents office. So that's IP Australia for us uh, in the local language, obviously here English, using your own local patent attorney. Um, and basically you do all the initial formalities and paperwork at that stage very conveniently and just once. So then later when you need to extend the application into other countries, all those formality parts are already completed. Um, and the good thing is they're recognized by all the other countries that you go into ultimately, as is uh, the PCT filing date. So you can see how that simplifies and reduces the initial costs and complexity uh, significantly. So um, another good thing, PCT lets us defer those decisions on what foreign countries you want for two and a half years after your provisional filing date. Uh, otherwise, all those foreign filing decisions would have to be made within 12 months of filing your provisional application, and usually that's too early. Um, the PCT searching phase starts shortly after you filed your PCT, um, and the examiner searches your invention and gives a preliminary patentability opinion, which could be good for uh, things like interacting investment or even aiding IP valuation. So, as long as you don't uh, withdraw the PCT application at that point, around six months after you file the PCT, you reach the publication stage where the PCT is published online and made uh, available publicly. So third parties or anyone really can read about your invention and your technology. 
So uh, then there is an optional international preliminary examination stage um, where you get a chance to have the preliminary patentability opinion reviewed if that's what you want to do. And then finally, you arrive at the national phase, um, which starts at 30 months from the provisional filing date. Um, and this is where at the point where you need to extend that PCT application into national patents in any foreign country that or region that you're interested in. Um, and the final cutoff is 31 months for many, many of those countries. So, and after the expiry of that 31 month period from your earliest filing date of your provisional, the PCT application is completed and you can't derive any other rights at that point. So that's just a, a bit of a summary on the PCT stages and timing. Great, thanks a lot for that, Mary. I guess I'll go to Chris next. Um, so you often see patents either around devices or around methods. What are the different types of patent and what are the benefits or disadvantages to each? Okay, thanks, Stephen. Um, I guess the different, well, before we start, uh, patents are about protecting functionality. So they're about protecting products or methods of doing things. So we have sort of the, the standard 20 year patent that you know about. Um, that, that's what everyone tends to think of when they think of a patent. You also have the provisional patent, um, which Mary mentioned. That's typically your first filing. That's uh, a confidential filing. So it, it essentially gets filed with IP Australia and sits in their servers for 12 months. No one can look at it, it's not published. Um, so it's sort of a holding pattern before you then move on to filing national applications or, or typically the PCT is the typical part. So typically you file a provisional application, one year later you file the, the PCT. We also have, um, there are a range of sort of second tier patents that are around, available around the world. Uh, we have the innovation patent at least until about August this year when it will die. Um, China has utility models and, and you'll find some of those in, in various European countries and they're sort of a, a, a second level patent that typically a novelty only and, and have more limited rights. Uh, but when people think about patents, they normally think of the, the standard 20 year patent where you have a higher standard of novelty and inventiveness threshold. Uh, the one other thing to be aware of is in the US, you also have design patents. Uh, that's the equivalent of Australian registered design. Both of those are designed to protect the, the appearance of something rather than the functionality. That's kind of the, the general type. Um, now, within a pattern itself, um, you can direct that to, to various things. So it, it could be to a physical apparatus or a, a physical system, um, you know, a machine. Uh, it might be to a method, so a method of using that machine um, or a method of making something or, you know, method of operation. So software typically is, is a, a methodology. Uh, and then you also have composition of matter. So that's things like um, chemical compounds, biological compounds, um, covers those sorts of things. And typically within a patent, you'll, you'll find that there's um, a set of independent claims to each of the different types. So say you have a, a medical device, you might have a set of claims that are directed to the physical device itself and how it operates. Then you might have a separate parallel set of claims to the method of use of that medical device. In the same way, if you have a software system, you might have a method of, of using the software uh, as well as a computing system, physical computing system um, implementing that, that. So within the patent itself, you'll, you'll see there are different sort of, you know, I guess subtypes, but, but it's still about protecting that, that functionality, that how that's embodied and, and, and how that operates. That I'll pass it back to you, Steve, for the next question. Thank you very much. So I'll go to Sean next. Um, so I guess maybe from you, if you could just give us a quick introduction to what landscape searches and freedom to operate searches are and at what point a company or a startup should consider in conducting one of those? Yeah, sure. So this also somewhat relates to the question that um, has been asked, you know, what's the distinction between filing a provisional patent and freedom to operate? So when you've, when you've come up with some sort of product you want to commercialize, you've invented something, um, there's a couple of questions that you can ask, you know, do I want to file a patent application? And if you do, there's a couple of requirements for that. So your invention has to be new and it has to be inventive generally in, um, in light of sort of everything that exists at the time that you file. 
the application. So it'd be pretty useful to know before you make sort of an expense into filing a patent application and um, going through that process, hey, is, is my invention actually new? Is it actually inventive? Um, so that's where sort of a landscape search can come in. Now you don't have to do that before you file your first provisional application. If you, if you don't want to, you can sort of do that anytime throughout the patenting process and the various patent offices do that for you if you sort of wait long enough. Um, so generally what they look for in these landscape searches might be, it could also be referred to as like a novelty search is, hey, this is sort of the state of the art at uh, whatever the relevant time is. So when you filed your patent application or when you're thinking about doing so, and how different is your product from this? Does it provide any sort of advantages? Um, so patent offices or a searcher will look at sort of published patent applications, um, uh, research literature, so people's papers have been published through universities, things like that. Basically anything that exists before you filed your patent application is relevant there um, in general. Freedom to operate is different. So you've invented this product and you wanna know, hey, if I go and commercialize this, am I gonna be infringing anybody else's intellectual property rights? So has anybody else got a patent application or a granted patent with claims that would read onto my product? Um, so that can is typically a far more expensive endeavor than simply a landscape search or novelty search. It's also referred to as an infringement search in some cases, because not only do you have to search for um, through databases of other people's patents, patent applications, but you have to assess the claims of those patent applications, see, okay, what is the scope of the, the monopoly that they have defined? So what are they actually protecting in that patent application? And then does my product fall within the scope of what their patent is protecting? If it's a pending patent application, so it hasn't granted yet, then can they change the claims of their patent to read onto mine after the fact? That's another analysis that can be done. It's called future claims analysis. That's very expensive. Um, so when, when do you want to do these things? Uh, landscape search, it's good to know the landscape throughout the entire process. Um, you don't need to commission a landscape search at any particular time. Um, there's a couple of points in the process that Mary described earlier where it, where it happens throughout the patent process. FTO searching should be taken into consideration all the way through the development of your, of your product. So at the beginning, you might want to test the waters, see if there's any major impediments to your idea that are out there. But the cost for a detailed FTO analysis is, is very high. In some cases, it's prohibitively high. So if it's at an early stage of the product development process, the value might be low. So if the product's likely to change significantly over the next six to 12 months, then if you make this expense now to this detailed search and analysis and the product's changed, well, the analysis might be completely different. If you've narrowed down the product to something that you're pretty comfortable as close to what you're going to commercialize, then um, it, it might be worth making the investment then. It's always a balance between the amount of risk that you're willing to take though and how much money you're willing to spend. So I've seen companies spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on FTO analysis for a single product. Um, that's in a very high risk space. Medical devices in particular tends to be a very high, um, high risk, very litigious space. Um, if you have a successful product. So the, the, the cost can range from, from very little like landscape searches, a couple thousand dollars to detailed FGN analysis, 60 to a hundred thousand dollars. Typically, if you're a startup, the purpose is to show potential investors that you've at least looked. So if you can show them, hey, look, we haven't been able to identify any major impediments. In some cases, that's good enough. So some investors might do their own due diligence. Um, but yeah, I guess that's a summary of landscape and FGO searches. I think that really shows the value of having a patent attorney on the ride with you as a startup from early on to be able to provide that advice as well. And um, I guess so I'll come back to you, Chris. Um, say I've come up with a device that can measure, an in vitro diagnostic device can measure every biomarker, and I don't know what to do with it next. What's your advice? What do I need to prove that it works first? Um, do I look for my own, do my own patent search before I come to you, or do I just come to you with the idea? Yeah, thanks, Steve. Um, I'd say probably talk to your patent attorney first of all, uh, just to start to work out a potential strategy and identify, you know, potential hurdles, what work to do next, and and sort of start to scope out um, how you move forward from from there. Uh, with um, the, the question of searching, um, you know, I personally, I think it's good to go in there and do a bit of bit of your own searching first off. Get familiar with the patent databases. You know, Google have their their Google Patents, and and there's the Lens and, and various places that that have good open source um, free searches, and it also sort of exposes you to to what's out there. Um, 
then you know you, you might want to consider a, a commercial search um, if you want to get into a bit more detailed. The, the important sort of thing I think is um, Sean sort of mentioning is, is you want to understand what's your point of difference. Um, what have you done that, that's special? You know, what's novel and why is this useful? Um, and then that sort of leads you into that you, you sort of got to start to think about your business plan really uh, early on. It's, it's like, okay, I've done something. I've got this great new device. It can measure every biomarker. Um, do we actually need it to measure every biomarker? Is there a particular biomarker that, that's of more value? Should we focus ourselves on that and get our data on, on that first? Um, you really want to start to understand um, whose problem are you solving? Who are you going to be your customers and why are they going to want your, your product? Um, and then you sort of start to work back, you know, okay, how are we going to get to getting it to them? Who do we have to partner with? What's our, our process for, for moving forward? You, I think it's good to sort of start thinking about those things early um, because that can guide what sort of steps you do. Okay, you've got this idea for a design, maybe you're going to build a prototype next. Um, you know, the way you go about designing that might be guided by what you think your ultimate strategy will, will be, who you're gonna to market to first, who you're gonna try and partner with first and, and, and solving their problem. Um, I, I think in terms of, of next steps, in, in terms of how, I guess how developed does it have to be, you should at least sort of have thought through the design of it, even if you don't have a working version. Um, I like to say, delay filing a patent application for as long as possible and get as far along that, that, that development process as you can because you have a much better understanding of what you've actually done, what you've actually created and what the potential value is and, and, and market is. Now, whether or not, how long you can delay depends upon you know, a lot of factors as, as do you need to publish it, other investors involved, um, things like that, that, that will creep into it. So at least you sort of want to get to that stage of understanding the design such that I could explain it to another engineer or a scientist and, and, and they would believe what I'm saying. And in terms of what supporting data you need to get, um, look, having some data is great. You don't always need it if you've got, you know, a, a well-developed engineering design on, on, on a meta product. Um, and in terms of how confident you have to be about that information, you, you, you've got to at least be at that, that point, whereas I think I've solved the major problems. This is the critical bit. Even if I've still got to do more experiments, once you've sort of hit that, that sort of, um, you sort of done that design, you think you understand how it works, that's certainly the point where you can start to look at filing a provisional application. And remembering that provisional application is, is confidential for the next 12 months. So it still gives you time to develop it further. Um, perhaps gain some more data to, to, to add into to a subsequent application. I'll leave it there and pass on the back. Um, I, I'll come back to you, Sean. So I ha happen to know that there's um, one startup in the audience that I spoke to recently um, and gave some advice that I guess something that we see quite a lot with MDPP is um, lots of people come uh, IP is a huge part. We work at that really early stage uh, and people have a little bit of uncertainty around um, what they're willing to spend on patents. And the advice I always give is that ultimately your whole business will be based on your IP. So it's often possibly a little undervalued, I think, in the early stages, but really the, the relationship with your patent attorney um, is so important. So what do you think are the most important things when you're when a startup's looking for a patent attorney? What are the most important things about how you sort of develop that relationship, considering that it could be years that you're working together? Yeah, so for me, the most important thing is, is trust. So there needs to be sort of a mutual trust that the clients of the organization knows that the patent attorney has a sufficient technical background so that they actually understand the technology, they understand the space, um, but they'll be able to work with you through that process. And the other element of trust is that they're actually acting in your best interests. So any, any patent attorney I know that's worth their salt will be acting in the client's best interests. Um, so that, the other thing is that the, the patent attorney needs to understand the, the business's goals. So organizations don't always file a patent application so that they can sue someone later. Like often that's, that's a possibility, but it's maybe the founders want an exit in 18 months and two years and a well-developed and well-thought-out IP strategy will allow them to achieve that. So that's where it comes to looking at your patent attorney as 
sort of a trusted business advisor within their field of confidence, which is the IP space. Um, and if you can get those things, those things sorted out early, then you can save a lot of costs. The other, the other side of that though, is that the client makes the patent attorney's life a lot easier if they're active in the patent attorney process. So, I mean, in some of the cases we, we have to act through accountants who uh, you know, checking a checkbox for their client that they have to do something in, in their IP portfolio. And that's often a nightmare to deal with because the accountant rarely has a deep understanding of the technology. Um, it's always easier to talk to the people who sort of invented it, the founders, the inventors. And so when you have that sort of mutual relationship there, they can trust the IP advisor and the IP advisor being provided with the necessary information to be able to do their job effectively. That's sort of how you get the best results. And that's what you should look out for early. Great, thanks a lot, Sean. Um, next question, Mary. Um, we spoke before Christmas and um, I had a great chat with you about people receiving bad written opinion. And I thought it was really interesting, your response. So yeah, I'd just love to hear some of the experiences you've had from when people have received bad written opinion and, and what you should really be looking for. Uh, you're still on mute, Mary. Sorry, Stephen. No <laughs> all right, yes, oh, the all negative opinion. <laughs> um, look, I've seen a lot of them. <laughs> um, I think the first thing, and probably the most important thing to remember is don't panic. <laughs> um, you know, especially for startups, it might be your first opinion um, and it's negative, it looks scary. Um, and yeah, you think, oh, positive opinion. Oh, that looks great. Um, but honestly, when I see these, it just makes me wonder if I've drafted the claims too narrowly um, and the examiner hasn't caught any relevant prior art. So I'm nearly more worried when I see a completely positive opinion. So like I said, look, they're really common. Um, they can look a bit scary, but actually if you bite the bullet and you tackle those objections early, it can really put you in a comfortable zone where you understand deeply what your main obstacles to securing rights are. So actually, when I get a negative opinion, my first thought isn't, uh oh, we're in trouble here. It's more, oh no, the client won't want to spend any more money reviewing this prior art and formulating a way forward. And I understand why, but I also know the comfort that they will get when they do do that okay so really it is the best thing you can do because uh, it forces you to develop your best arguments and your strategy for getting grant even before you hit the national phase at all um, and compared that to when you get a partially positive opinion where the examiner says some stuff is novel some stuff is inventive actually we don't, we don't tend to really consider to any degree what the examiner, where the examiner might be wrong there. And then we just cross our fingers and, and we go for a 30 or a 50K national phase filing program, but we haven't really understood the prior act position properly there at all yet. So in my view, when you look at it that way, actually a negative opinion when handled correctly is actually a good thing. So, I mean, if you think as well, what are your choices? What are your choices after you get a, a, a negative opinion? So your first choice is you do nothing um, and you pray you're not wasting all that money going to the national phase, phase effectively blind. Um, your second choice is um, uh, what I think is the best one and it's to get your attorney to review the prior art, to review the objections uh, in detail and to provide a strategy to address the objections and in my opinion, that's worth its weight in gold as it's going to save so much money later on when you're actually in prosecution in all these other countries, especially when you file any amendments uh, early in the national phase. So you're potentially skipping rounds of prosecution by cutting to the chase and going straight to the bullseye where you know your invention is in light of that prior act in the negative opinion. Um, you can, if you want to, use the optional international examination procedure um, where you essentially do the review, formulate the arguments, but submit it to the examiner for formal consideration. But the official fees do, for doing that are expensive enough. Um, and because it's a non-binding opinion anyway, I think you're better off uh, sometimes just having the, the patent attorney opinion full stop. 
Um, you know, if you have different reasons for wanting to get that positive opinion on paper, that's something that can be done. But I think a good attorney opinion is enough in most cases. And then I would say in the worst case scenario where there's absolutely nothing salvageable, uh, you can, because it's not published yet, the PCT application is not published for 18 months after priority, you could consider withdrawing the case and redrafting the application as needed, as long as you haven't disclosed it, um, with further experiments or inventive tweaks, if possible. But to be honest, um, in the 15 years that I've been doing this, I, I can't actually remember a single well-drafted life sciences or med tech case where we didn't get something once the prior art is considered properly um, and proper and sensible arguments based on patenting rules are actually presented to an examiner. But look, I think actually the best strategy here is to avoid any of that uh, negative opinion, shock, surprise stuff from happening in the PCT at all. Uh, and you can actually do that really easily because IP Australia, if you ask them, will do an international type search on your provisional application, which is exactly the same as the PCT search. Um, the official fees for doing the search are lower. Um, and best of all, you still get an opportunity to amend, to, to bolster that specification, your provisional specification, if it's not enough to actually deal with the prior art that the examiner has found. Um, so yeah, that's not expensive at all. And, and another nice thing is that those official fees you pay to IP Australia for that international type search on your provisional application are actually refunded later in the PCT stage if the examiner can rely on that earlier search for building the PCT international search. So in my view, that's the best way to, to deal with it at all, avoid the problem. Great, thanks, Mary. It's it was really good to hear that from you before Christmas because it's something that we do see. So a lot of the people who apply to our program, uh, some haven't considered patents yet. Some are just at that point where they're getting bad written opinion. And I think it's really useful for me. I always say to them now, don't worry, don't panic. You're on the right track. You you definitely do want this. Just stay calm and keep keep going with the process. Yeah, and look, Stephen, if we had more time, I could go into, you know, the uh, another in some interesting points about why it's a negative opinion. But I th I think it's probably you know we won't have enough time today. But it, it, there's definitely some sensible reasoning behind what's going on. Yeah. Um, and unfortunately, when you're new to the process, it can be a bit disconcerting. But as I said, key step, don't panic, talk to your yeah. patent attorney. <laughs> I think maybe, hopefully if everyone knows that before it happens and they're expecting it, hopefully there's no people crying in your office and you don't have or to. Or losing sleep, that's right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, so just uh, for everyone watching, um, we haven't had too many questions through, please, we're more than happy if it's very specific to your situation, if you're happy to talk about it or if you want to go more general, absolutely fine you want if we still been a little bit too high level and you want something a little bit more simplistic any questions you want absolutely fine there's no judgment it's always hard to know how to pitch these because people have such a wide range of knowledge and um, so I'm more than happy to see questions from very simple to very complicated uh, one question i'll throw to um sean so on the registration form for this event we did allow people to submit a question one person, and this is interesting because it's not something that I've come across before. And um, someone said that, I, I guess thinking along the lines of, um, we always hear that a patent is only valuable if we can actually afford to protect it. Um, what are your thoughts around IP insurance and whether that's a useful mechanism for protecting your IP? So I think we'll, I'll start with the first part of that question. So. I'd strongly disagree with a patent only being valuable if you have the funds to sort of enforce it or protect it. I mean, almost all, no, most startups won't have the funds to inf enforce a patent application. Um, yeah, it's, it's a vital asset if you're going to move forward. It's, it's potentially the startup's only asset. Um, and big companies would be much happier to buy it off you in a lot of cases than to go to court to challenge you because it's expensive for them as well. Um, if you're in a position where someone's wanting to copy you, it's probably because you've got a successful 
product and there's a big chance that someone who can enforce your patent will want to start working with you as well. So that's usually um, a more viable option than just avoiding the patent system because of the expense um, together. Now, when it comes to IP insurance, there's, there's generally two types. So there's patent enforcement insurance. So if you have a patent application and you want to enforce that against someone, it will assist you in covering your legal costs to take action and patent infringement insur liability insurance. So if somebody accuses you of patent infringement, then um, that will help you sort of cover the costs there. We generally don't recommend um, IP insurance for, for our startup clients. So like when you think about it, the viable market for these products pres is presumably businesses that are at sufficient risk of becoming litigated against to, take out, to justify taking out the insurance policy, but not, they're not uninsurable. So they're not gonna get sued all the day, every day. Um, for the insurance company to have to deal with that. Generally a startup, in our opinion, wouldn't fall into that category of company. I mean, if you're a startup as well, the last thing you wanna be doing is spending five figures of money on insurance premiums uh, when you don't even know whether or not your product is gonna take off, especially in the early stages. And in most cases, when you get to the later success, more successful stages, you start having more money available, it becomes less of an issue. So in our opinion, IP insurance in most cases is probably not worth it, but it comes down to sort of the specific organization, what their goals are, what their business strategy is. Um, so it's it's kind of gonna be considered on a case by case basis. So really sort of at that point where you're taking market share away from some of the bigger companies that might start to wake up to you, that's the point where you might start to see more action and it might be more valuable. Yeah, that's right. That's generally when they start to notice you. They might know that your IP exists before then because these big companies, when they have successful products, they do their own sort of freedom to operate analysis. And if they're trying to refine their product and they see that you have an earlier patent application, they might become aware of it. But in my experience, they tend not to do anything about it unless there's some noticeable effect on their company because it's very expensive for them to do so as well. And it looks like we've had one question come in that says the purpose of the patent is to stop other entities from stealing your IP. I guess that's sort of saying, well, if I want to protect, do, is the insurance useful if, if I'm worried that someone else might steal my IP? Is that insurance useful for me stopping other people from stealing it? I mean, it, it can be, um, but like I said before, it's very situation dependent and generally, um, in our opinion, it's not the right product for most startups. Um, there's, there is more aspects to patentability. So the only reason you have a patent isn't necessarily so that you can enforce it against other people. So patents also provide roadblocks to your competitors. So if a competitor knows that you have a patent application or a granted patent, they know, okay, maybe I should avoid going into that space. So maybe you avoid them becoming a competitor in that particular space. Um, maybe that space is attractive, but they have to design an inferior product to get around your patent application if possible, if it's even possible. Um, and so you always have a competitive advantage. That's that's sort of another key aspect of patents that's often overlooked. Great, thank you. Um, so come to you next, Mary. So next question we've had sort of goes back towards uh, what Chris was talking about earlier, but um, in terms of knowing the details of um, a device to file a provisional patent application, um, Damien's asking which stage of their development process or their development journey is it appropriate to start filing that provisional patent application? Okay, so I think in, well, we're, okay. So we've talked um, already about this sort of 12 month from the provisional filing date when you have to file a PCT and it's like true commitment, sort yeah. of get married. <laughs> get married to what you've said is the invention in the provisional application. So you can file a provisional application at any time, but there's a risk if it's too early that you actually haven't covered what's truly the invention or the, um, the part of the technology that's going to give you the commercial advantage. Um, under patent law, there's also some, most people have heard of novelty and inventive step, but there's some support enablement sufficiency requirements as well, which means that you need to have described the invention in such a way that a third party could actually carry out that invention just from reading the patent specification as part of the patent bargain. So if you've sort of filed an application and it's all a little bit high in the sky or a bit weak or um short on description 
even if you do proceed on that basis to a PCT and later on, you're probably going to run into trouble. Depends on the technology as well, but it can, that is a big risk. And I do understand that you do need to talk to people. You need to talk to, to um, potential investors and others along the journey. But I think maybe the solution here for someone who's not so sure is to file the provisional application, but recall that you can always withdraw it. Um, and that means subject to you being very careful that you're not disclosing it out of NDA terms or out of confidentiality terms. Um, and then you would be in a position to later file um, a more substantial application if that was what was needed. Um, yeah, right. so I, I don't know if that's answered your question. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think it's that's difficult. Really yeah, I appreciate timing is difficult. Yeah, no, I think that's really good advice. Um, thanks for that. So next question, I'll go to you, Chris. Um, so we've got a question from an anonymous attendee. A uh, business partner and I had co-invented a medical device five months ago. Business partner filed a provisional patent application without consulting, only put his name down and would like the title in, in his, uh, in, to be held by the company. What advice would you give? Okay. Um, that's certainly a more complicated scenario. Um, the... To, to get a patent, you have to prove you have entitlement from the inventors. Yeah. Um, so the patent, even if it's filed in someone else's name, they've still got to be able to prove that they have entitlement from all the inventors. Um, so there, there's a question of validity, you know, in there un, unless you've agreed to to transfer your rights to that company. Now, if they've gone off and done that separately. Um, probably the best thing is to chat to them and say, well, um, you know, see if you can work out a, a joint arrangement that that um, um, can allow you to commercialise it together uh, and, and shares the, the royalties t together. Um, it's typically best to have a single entity own the patent because um, if you have separate owners, they can each independently sort of exploit the patent independent of each other's. That's really messy. It gets really complicated and and all the patent attorneys, I think, will say avoid it if you, you can. The um, if you can't come to a resolution, that's always possible to apply to the patent office and, and get them to make a determination. Um, but it tends to be better to try and negotiate it beforehand. Work out, you know, if he wants his company to hold it, that, that that's fine. But he needs to get a formal assignment of the rights from you as a co-inventor, uh, and so you need to come to an agreement of what it's going to take you to, to, to do that. Um, it might be that it's better to set up a separate company and, and create the share arrangement and, and do it that way. Um, but essentially, the, at the end of the day, the inventors are the first owners. They, they've got um, the, whoever ultimately owns the patent has to show a, a chain of ownership from all of those inventors. So at the moment, it's in a single entity. He's going to have to name you as a co-inventor. At the moment, it's deficient. Uh, now, a provisional application, you don't have to list the inventors, but eventually he will have to list all the inventors and he'll have to be able to establish how he gets ownership from all of them. So at the moment, if he doesn't have something from you and you're not prepared to give it, um, then you really you know, go and have a chat and work out a way of moving it forward. Trying to sort this stuff out earlier is, is always better and understanding how you're going to carry the risk and who pays for what. Um, how are you going to move this forward into a commercial product is, is what you should be thinking. And, and when you go to talk to them, negotiate, you know, you think about how this is going to be a long-term partnership. How do we make it work? Yeah. And so, so sometimes we have to explain as well with our program that we're involved in the invention. So we are often named as inventors on a pattern. It doesn't give us the ownership of the pattern. Um, we hand over all those rights to our, our applicants, but we have to be named on there because we had that. Um, involvement in the invention. Um, so really good advice. Thank you for that, Chris. I think next I'll go to Elka's question. So um, any suggestions? I think I'll go to Sean. Um, any suggestions or advice on manufacturing in China and IP protection and whether there's any ways of de-risking? Yes, there's always some risks that will be inherent in manufacturing in China. Um, I've, I've been involved in a, a patent litigation case in China, and my understanding of the situation is that the use, utility of patents in China has changed significantly over the past 10 years. Um, so 
More recently, foreign companies have been having a great deal of success enforcing their IP rights in China. Um, the, the Chinese system is obviously unique. And if you're, say, an Australian company manufacturing in China, working through an Australian advisor, your Australian patent attorney will work with their sort of Chinese contemporary um, on the case, and the Chinese specialists will be the one that deal with it. But um, China does have a, a relatively robust patent system now for foreign companies that wish to enforce there, um, and they have the means to enforce. So, and and it's actually not that expensive um, to enforce in China relative to in places like the US. It's it's far cheaper. Um, so the fact that you can have some success there, it's, it's relatively cheap and it's moving in the right direction is all encouraging. In, in terms of de-risking, you just, most people sort of that I've seen who considered manufacturing in China haven't properly understood the risks of manufacturing there. And I mean, one thing that I've seen happen is you have a successful um, patent case against one company who then sort of phoenixes as another company and you have to try and deal with it again. And there are mechanisms for doing that, but it's just understanding the risk before you do it and making an informed business decision. Yeah, this is definitely what I want to do. These are the risks. These will be the costs involved if I have to ever pursue anything. Um, and you need to make that consideration relatively early. So when you're, after, uh, when you're entering national phase is, is sort of the main time period to decide whether you want to go into China. There are earlier time periods that you can do it depending on your business strategy, because there's, there's different sort of patent strategies in China. They have utility models, they have standard patents. Um, but just make sure you know what you're getting into before you make the commitment would be my advice there. Great. Thanks, John. Um, go to Mary next. Um, again, I think we've touched on this a couple of times, but um, do you recommend doing a landscape search prior to filing a provisional patent? So if it, uh, well, yeah. Okay. So if money is not an option, yes. If money is an option, yes, but do it yourself. <laughs> um, I think for that question, it also really depends on what information you're trying to get out of the search. So if it's competitors, absolutely. Um, a keyword search, some if, if you can work it out, some international patent classification assistance can really give you a good overview of um, um, who some of the active players are in that particular area. Um, one interesting thing, actually, um, I mentioned the international type search from IP Australia. They are actually giving uh, free uh, landscape searches as part of that international type search um, service. So that can be something to be aware of as well. But um, I would always recommend that people have a go at doing their own um, basic searching because there's a huge amount of information out there for you. Things like finding potential collaboration partners, finding potential licensees, looking at technology that might be advantageous for your company to, to look at licensing in or cross licensing. So as part of a program for really gathering um, intellectual property intelligence, you should actually do that regularly, I think. Yeah. And that's something we do with our programs. So anyone who comes, we'll always do our own. We'll go on patent scope, we'll do our own patent search. You might not catch everything, but you can get a really good idea very quickly. And we often stumble across competitors because we've come across a patent. Often yeah. you find patents and we don't find the company related to them, um, but it's really, really valuable. And even if you've never done it before, it's not very complicated to work out. And once you've looked through a few patents and you start to understand the language, I think anyone, anyone can have a go. It's not. Yeah. It's not yeah, absolutely. the most definitive search, but it's a good, definitely a good start. Um, as far as I know, the EPO, the European Patent Office, their search engine is a Spassnet. That's the one that's my go-to, probably because when I trained, that's what I used all the time. So I'd be pretty familiar with it. But there are pretty good videos on um, the European Patents Office website and pretty good documentation about how you use the databases and particularly how you would truncate keywords and devise simple search strings and search strategies, which really, once you put a little bit of effort into, you actually could get quite good at quickly. So there are so many free for use uh, internet databases for patents now. I mean, Chris mentioned Google Patents, I think as well, Patent Lens, but if and when it comes to the time that you need 
more highbrow searching, your patent attorney no doubt will be able to get someone who can access some of the commercial data databases that are incredibly powerful, and not least in, in, in terms of function like eliminating duplicates or, you know, bringing down, condensing what looks like 15 different applications for you to review down to one that might have been the originating application. So it can actually unburden you a lot in terms of searching, because that's the main problem. It's incredibly time consuming to go through all of the records that you find. Yeah, especially when they've got 50 claims and you try and read through and they'll <laughs> refer back to each other and it can be very Absolutely, yeah. Thanks so much, everyone. So just quickly, uh, Bruce's question, I think I'll just answer that quickly by saying you will find patent attorneys that specialize in absolutely everything. And I'm sure everyone here today could recommend someone who would be capable of doing that. I would suggest maybe reaching out to each of our um, panelists today to ask for their opinion. Um, but patent attorneys have very broad experience and we, we often, as part of our process, we have workshops and we'll invite different patent attorneys along and the, um, the breadth of knowledge that they're able to bring is really, really helpful. So yeah, I encourage you to reach out and ask them outside of, of this. Um, but yeah, just finally, thanks everyone. Thanks so much for the conversation and for all of your insights, it's been, it's been really useful. And I'll echo that. Thank you, Stephen, and thanks to the panel for being here and answering everyone's questions. If you have any other questions or more specific ones and you would like to reach out to anyone on our panel today, their um, contact details are available here. Uh, if you miss that, please get in contact with Stephen or I and we can refer you on as well. Um, thank you very much for joining us for our inaugural MedTech Mondays webinar series. We'll be running these once a month on a Monday. Um, so if you'd like to keep in touch with us, please go to the website and sign up to our um, newsletter so you'll get all the information about the following series. And after the um, webinar concludes, there'll be a quick survey that gives you the opportunity to input into what you might like to see in MedTech Monday so we can actually structure the uh, webinar series around what your needs are. So thank you again for logging on. Um, once again, this will be available up within a week uh, if you would like to view it again. And thank you to the panel. And we will see you again on a Monday in the near future.